Hi, I'm Nicholas Bertner with School of Permaculture, and today we get to do something really awesome. Uh, we're with uh, an author, a very well-known author, and somebody that I, I respect uh, very much, Mr. Brad Lancaster. So, Brad, how are you doing today? Great. Awesome. Uh, so, we came out here and we got to tour your site. It's spectacular. You got a lot of um, dryland urban technique and strategy going on and I want to get into that but I think what um, uh, what a lot of people might want to know is Brad like how did you how did you really get into this living and this ideology like what kind of what kind of cracked your shell open you know? uh, well I think I've been looking for something for a long time I uh, was tired of seeing problems and uh, saw how our water situation steadily got worse, how uh, the rate of consumption seemed to steadily increase, seeing how the, the playgrounds, which were these wild areas that I would play in as a kid, were all getting bladed and built upon, and all those like, natural oases were disappearing. So um, it was in that context that I was looking for alternatives. Um, I didn't want to be part of the problem, I wanted to be part of the solution, but I didn't know how to find that path. And uh, so it was at that time I took a permaculture class, and it was great for me because that's the first time I had been exposed to integrated thinking, where um, you're, you're considering many different things going on, and uh, as opposed to just a one-track uh, mind. And uh, just got really turned on by it, and saw a lot of hope in it and that it seemed to be more solution-based as opposed to um, just analyzing problems. So, uh, but I came out of that class with way more questions than answers. Huh. And uh, I was enamored with these concepts that I came across in the course. But I didn't feel that the course had given me full examples because you read something you're not walking through it all right so um, so I started seeking those out and I had the opportunity to go to southern Africa because my mom's from South Africa for a family reunion and uh, I took that opportunity to uh, visit a number of sites in Botswana, Zimbabwe, South Africa and I was seeking out um, people uh, doing sustainable farming, permaculture, and so on. And that's where I got to meet this African water farmer, Mr. Zephaniah Piri Maseko, who became an uh, incredible mentor to me. And what was amazing there is he enabled me to see the whole that I was in, introduced to in the permaculture course, but that I didn't experience in the permaculture course. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he had worked his whole site from the top of the watershed all the way down doing all these different integrated strategies to improve the hydrology, improve the fertility, um, improve the production, the wildlife habitat, the passive cooling, the passive heating, and uh, all doing so in a way, only using what he already had on site, and only doing it in a way that he and his family could create it and maintain it. Um, so, very sustainable. And uh, I just got super excited. Okay, now I, that's when it clicked. I said, okay, I, I got exposed to the concepts, but since I hadn't experienced it, it, didn't, it wasn't real until that point. And then I was like, all right, you did this, I could do this. And uh, so at the um, end of the day, I only spent one day with him, seeing all the work he had done over a 30 year period. Uh, I was super impressed. His well levels had gone up, as had his immediate neighbors. But in the, in the area, people were literally dying of thirst because they just kept extracting, extracting water, mm -hmm. never giving back. Whereas Mr. Peary, the bulk of his efforts were, how do we capture the rain when it falls as close as possible to where it falls, and how do we reinvest it in the soil so that we are building mm -hmm. our water resources? The rain is our income. We invest it. The groundwater is our capital. Mm -hmm. So here in the United States, especially in the Western United States, we're all about living off savings. We're living off our capital. You know, oh, we nice. just keep pumping the groundwater. Basically, 
m really making things bad for those to follow and for us at the end of our lives. So um, Mr. Peary shifted all that. He's like, no, rainwater's the income. That's what you work with, and you invest it to build more. Okay. Yeah, wow. That's great. So um, seeing what he had done, realizing it was just he and his family, just hand tools and their sweat that did it, I knew it was possible. And I told him how bad the situation was around water and other things here in Arizona. And I said, you know, I don't, I want to go back to that. I don't want to keep being part of the problem. I want to leave. And I said, do you have any advice on what I should look for? And he said, yeah, you can't leave. You have to go back and you have to set your roots deeper than you ever thought possible. And you have to figure out solutions. Because if you run from your problems, you're just going to plant problems everywhere you go. Beautiful. Whereas if you can figure out solutions, well, then you have the ability to figure out solutions wherever you are. And you might then be able to plant solutions as opposed to problems. So it was the permaculture course that showed me a different way. It was Mr. Zephaniah Piri Maseko that showed me a realized integrated system. He just has a sixth grade formal education. He has an amazing master's PhD life education. <laughs> and uh, he taught me that we have the greatest power to start where we are, wherever we are, in our own lives. And he then challenged me to do just that for myself. So I came home determined to try and find solutions. And I knew it was possible because I had seen he had found solutions where he was. I knew things were going to have to shift because I'm in a different place. But um, and that, and everything's led from that. And this book came from that because I uh, found that uh, it was really hard to find the water harvesting resource, particularly for an American mindset and all, mm -hmm. um, that was easily accessible and uh, enabled one to assess a site, figure out what to do, and then move forward. Uh, permaculture is a great basis of that, but it didn't go as deep as I wanted it to. So I ended up creating this tool that I was searching for, actually based around the learnings from Mr. Peary. He's the chapter one of this book. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's some great insight. Um, that, that, just going through that story got, kind of had me reflecting a little bit on some, some things that a lot of people say when they go to a course. Um, which you'd mentioned right at the very beginning that you needed to see, see it, like what you got to see with Mr. Peary is you got to see it happen. But before that made an actual impact, you had to take that permaculture design course. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you imagine him going to see that? Would it have would it have had the same impact on you? No, I don't think I would have been looking for the same things. I probably wouldn't have even been drawn to his site in the first place. Yeah. So you had mentioned a couple of words in uh, uh, integrated thinking. Mm -hmm. um, that's very interesting because when people get into permaculture a lot, they they do kind of go into well, it's a banana circle, or it's a food forest, or mm. it's a sheet mulch garden. You subconsciously just now said it had me, it was the first thing that introduced me to integrate thinking. Would you expand a little bit more on that? I don't come into it, I want a garden here. Oh, yeah. I first come into it, what are the patterns going on with the sun? Cool, I got that. Now that can inform if a garden's even appropriate and where it would go. And then I can look at wind water so I mean I think what um, to kind of break that down see when we're taking a permaculture design course it's to learn how to design mm -hmm. but what we don't get into a lot is okay now we've learned how to design how does that actually look when you go onto a property yeah and so what you had just given us was like these are some of the your own operating procedures like 
you don't go in and say, well, I know, you know, just point blanche, I'm going to put a straw bale the house in here. Mm -hmm. You know, you particularly, you know, so this is like almost like consulting, permaculture consulting 101. Mm -hmm. You go in and say, what's happening naturally with the pattern on this property? And then how can you then uh, remember a permaculture principle that goes in and says, this is what's reminding me of the pattern. That's what you're using the principles mm -hmm. for. And then from there, you're able to build strategy and technique. Mm -hmm. And that's that's substantial. I mean, that's a, um, that's a permaculture tip of the day uh, from Brad Lancaster. That's how he goes into a property, so. And I'll, I'll just distill that down a little further. So I look at it as, I come on, I start with pattern recognition. Okay, so what are the natural patterns? What's going on? Then I go to the principles, which are just a distillation of the processes, okay? okay. Um, and then I go from there to strategy. So I'm reading the pattern. So how can I then interact with that pattern, with what processes, and then what strategies could I use to further refine that down? And then after that, what do you, what do you get into then at that stage? Uh, well, then, then I'm good with uh, talking to the client and saying, okay, you know, what, what are your desires? What are you looking for here? And uh, sometimes I might question them, well, do you really think this is appropriate based on this understanding of what's happening here? Maybe we need to shift things. And let me stop right there. I think what's important to address with is how you approach that. Because in permaculture, and I've been guilty of it. We just have this sense of this air about us that we know everything, and 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 we know a lot. You mm -hmm. know, permaculture is a knowledge bomb. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very important to when you're actually consulting with customers, you go in and you ask them what is their vision. You know, if they have a, a particular place they want to put a garden, you know, we don't just go in and say, "Axe, sorry, ain't happening." Yeah. We approach it with that sensitivity and, you know, suggest other things. Exactly what you were saying, yeah. And here's an example. Um, I should have a blog up on this with photos and all in the next week. But I just yeah. was... What, what website? Uh, har yeah, harvestingrainwater.com. Perfect. And you'll see the blog in the upper right. So um, I was just in West Texas, in Alpine, Texas. And uh, the public library wanted Texas. me to do a, a workshop there. And um, they had a lot of bad flooding. The, all the water from the roof and the parking lot was just going right to the street, flooding the street. And they had planted some trees in this vacant uh, lot north of the parking lot where they wanted to get some uh, free irrigation for those trees. So um, I had drawn a little plan beforehand based on a Google Earth image and my understanding of what was going on the site. I said, well, you know, I want these basins here, moving the water this way, spreading it out. And then when I got on the site, I realized I got to throw all that out. <laughs> and uh, so first... Which happens often. <laughs> yeah. First, I got to look at what are the patterns. So simple it down, simplify it, water flows downhill. And it was taking the most direct course right to the street, causing flooding the street. So that wasn't good. We had a desire to spread it over more soil area, to infiltrate it, more of it, so it wouldn't flood the street so much. It could freely irrigate the trees. But the thing was, I had to back off of my desire to do certain earthworks or certain basins. That didn't matter. It didn't matter how. The key thing is, what was the key process that would work with the pattern? So how could we best slow spread and infiltrate the flow of water. Maybe it'd be a swale, maybe it would just be planting grass, maybe it would just be changing the way people moved across the land. Awesome. So instead of getting stuck on a strategy, it's just coming back and saying, all right, well what, what process yeah. would work with the existing flow pattern on this site? And I went through some real panic with the laser level I'm like, things ain't, aren't gelling. <laughs> and, uh, and when I finally just said, well, they're not gelling because I'm trying to force a strategy here. Mm -hmm. I was, and when I, I was trying to force a location of 
a diversion berm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I backed off of that and just said, no, let's just read the land. It will tell me where to put it. And we ended up doing way less work because we found instead of needing a whole complex of boomerang berms and stuff, we just needed one. One little berm that would divert water that was flowing off the parking lot to the street instead across a real subtle ridge line we couldn't see, but we picked it up with the laser level. Get the water over that ridge line and it would fill this massive natural basin that had never been getting water before wow. because of that little subtle ridge line. And then that water overflowed as sheet flow, not channelized flow, over a 40 foot wide stretch. And uh, so instead of concentrating the water to channelized flow that could become erosive, it spread it out as this nice, calm, shallow sheet flow. So we got more soil water interface, more infiltration. We're really hitting that slow it, spread it, sink it principle. Mm. And uh, dramatically reduced the flooding, dramatically enhanced infiltration of the water for the trees for a fraction of the work. So I have uh, a personal uh, question about consulting, mm -hmm. uh, me personally. What has been, um, over the years, and I also want to talk about that, that newer basin that you have, that you were mm -hmm. showing me out there too, but what has been over the years that has been, and this is just on your particular viewpoint, that doesn't mean it's the end all be all, so don't take this as, um, you know, do this only technique. I'm just curious to know, what has been the strategy or the technique that you have seen given you, on your properties, and I don't know if they're gonna be mainly drylands or not, that you have worked on that have shown the most promising uh, results of what they were designed to do. So when I visited Mr. Peary in Africa, um, he had transformed over a 30 year period a wasteland, an overgrazed, overcut, eroding wasteland into a relative oasis. And he did so without importing any material, okay? He did it, well, except for hand tools, okay? So he, he, was, he did all the work, he and his family, their own uh, labor, using hand tools to shape the earth in the way they did. Um, they used their livestock for their manure. They grew the biomass they needed to generate the mulch on site uh, to create the windbreaks and so on. And their only water source was rainfall and then what slowly developed over time, which was a shallow lens of, of groundwater, okay? So, that's, um, that's impressive, I'm just saying that as well, to, to make your own lens of fresh water. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they had no ability to tap deep groundwater. They had no ability to import municipal water or uh, from who knows where, or any, anything else like that. So. Um, as a result, he didn't look at this as a limitation. He looked at this as his greatest asset, okay? Because he said, he realized he had to get creative, okay? And the only limitation here was his own creativity and working with what he already had. And as a result, I think his example stands above the vast majority of examples I've seen mm. that are great, they're producing like crazy, but they're, they're still dependent on an import stream of water or fertilizer, even if it's organic fertilizer, mm -hmm. um, or, uh, or interns, you know, interns are great, <laughs> but I'm just saying, uh, the truth is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, how can we, we can go as far as Mr. Peary and only use what we have on the site from the very beginning to the end. Or maybe we have some importation, but let's work the design so that end goal is that we don't need that importation in the end. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, so when I was doing the work here on this site, I have city water. That's accessible. Okay. Um, I can go to the stores and buy uh, fertility or other things. And so um, I've been trying to see to what extent can I just work with what I have here on the site. So the majority of the landscape uh, surrounding and in our property, um, I am trying to grow just on on-site water. Just rainwater and the runoff from the street or a roof here on, of a building here. And that's it. And uh, so, um, awesome. so that, uh, 
weed won't look as lush as a neighbor that's willing to turn on the city hose. Okay? But um, if that city water goes down, we'll continue to thrive because we're not dependent on it. Um, and it also enables us to see, well, to become more creative. It's like, wow, well, I got to use what little water I have many, many times cycling through. Okay, first I uh, drink the water, and then I urinate the water, and then that goes to a plant, which further filters that water, and then as the plant grows, it's generating fruit, which I can eat. I'm ingesting that water yet again, okay? And that fruit tree is planted on the east or west side of my building, so it's passively cooling the building, thereby reducing my need to consume water to cool the building with an evaporative cooler, or let's say someone wanted to use an air conditioner, um, there's water consumption in an air conditioner because of the power that's needed to run it, okay? So I don't even need to use that. I can instead just use the shade tree in the right spot that's irrigated with my urine <laughs> and some roof runoff. Uh, you actually have a really, really nice urban composting toilet set up, and I think you have a video on that mm -hmm. already. So I'll show some pictures. But um, this... Um, dwelling that we're in, and I'm calling it a dwelling on camera, mm -hmm. um, it is solar passive, but there's nothing but a solar panel running a fan in the center of the room, and it's dramatically cooler in here, dramatically cooler, like it's very, like, it's very hot, what would you say the degrees were today? Uh, so right now outside it's nearing 90 degrees, and in here it's 76 degrees. Wow. Yeah. And so there's nothing other than that fan on, and that's run off solar panels. And your trees out here, um, when, when is it about, when, is, when do they start dropping leaves? Uh, usually the end of October, end of the month. Yeah, they're all nice and running, totally dependent, or are independent on sources that either come from the street or fall from the sky and then manage through, um, the network, the strategies you've put together. So what I'm hearing to the kind of answer that question is it depends because what's really, really outstanding is how much minimum input did you put in and maximum yield that you took out. And so your ability to design this property to do that, not being fed by the grid, not being fed by the IV of the water system from the city, uh, you're able to come in here and create your own lifeline. So this is permaculture, you know, mm -hmm. this is sustainable. And you haven't, you know, almost everything's reclaimed, which is very, very, you know, not too many people are doing that who are, who are setting up new permaculture sites. They're buying new equipment, you know, buying new roofing, all of this stuff. I mean, this, this bathtub that you have out here, it's probably reclaimed. You know? Oh yeah, <laughs> I dug that out of the ground 20 years ago. <laughs> the abandoned site in Globe, Arizona. And then, you know, I was looking at your kitchen out here and your, uh, your pots and pans are dumpster dived. Yeah, someone had just thrown them actually into uh, one of the water harvesting chicanes two blocks down the road. So I was like, sweet, harvesting water and cookware. <laughs> So the answer to that question, I think I'm understanding clearly now, is, is the most, you've got the most yield off of the least amount of input that you put in. That's very recommend, uh, applaudable. Well, I, I just want to make clear, that's what I'm striving for, and uh, the, our ability to evolve never ends, or you know, we, yeah. it shouldn't. Yeah. And, um, I also want to say while I use the permaculture principles that are awesome, I think it's also important that as we've used them, seeing what's worked, what's not, I think it's really good to stay thinking with a very critical mind. Mm -hmm. And how might you even tweak those principles yeah. as you gain experience to further enhance the effectiveness of your use of them? And maybe are there are some principles that could be added. So one I find that's really useful is um, 
it's really a question I'll ask myself in design is, what can I take out? Mm -hmm. So so often we want to come in and, oh, well, let's put in tanks, uh, let's, let's put in swales, let's build this structure over here, uh, we'll bring in these, you know, this, yeah. these crops. Yeah. So, um, but I'm looking at it like, yeah, okay, we can do all that, but what could I take out to further reduce my cost of implementation? So let me just give an example of the, wa the rainwater harvesting system. So the bulk of our rainwater is stored in the soil, not in tanks. And then we use the plants as living pumps to uptake the water and turn it into fruit, shade, shelter, you know, and so on. Um, so I always look to beginning the harvest of water in the soil as opposed to tanks. Because I already have the soil. Mm -hmm. I already have vegetation. Mm -hmm. Okay? So then, and by doing that, by uh, setting up a system so the vegetation is getting the bulk of its water from moisture harvested in the soil, the soil tank, okay, that greatly reduces my need for a manufactured tank. Okay? Um, and if I can mulch up that soil so that it more rapidly infiltrates water and greatly reduces the rate at which water evaporates, now water's sticking around in that soil even longer, further reducing my need for a tank. And where do I get that mulch? Well, I can get it from the tree. You know, trees have leaves. We call them leaves because you're supposed to leave them under the tree, right? Okay. And uh, so all my prunings go right back under the tree. And then, um, but let's say, all right, I really shrink my need for a tank. So now I, I, need a, I don't need such a big one. I can get away with a smaller one. So I put in a tank finally. And I'm only collecting the highest quality water, the water from my roof. Because cows don't fly, all right, and cars don't fly either. So um, street runoff, where I might have a cow walking along, and I definitely have cars parked, oozing oil, I don't want that water in a tank, okay? I want that in the soil, where the soil life can naturally filter it, bioremediate it for free. And I'll just focus on storing the water in a tank, co collecting the water from my roof. Yeah. That's yeah. much cleaner. And then, once I got the water in the tank, well, how am I going to get it back out? So a lot of people are like, yeah, you just put in a pump, and then you can run that, you can run it just like the average American home. Okay, but then I ask the question, well, do I need a pump? Or could I set it up in a way that does not need a pump? Can I take the pump out, and thus the electrical needs to run the pump, and thus the maintenance of the pump, and thus the replacement parts of the pump? Okay? Yeah. And uh, so that's when I then look at, well, how about just using gravity as the pressurized portion of the system as opposed to the pump, mm -hmm. okay? So I'd have pipes with either system, but I can choose a slightly larger diameter pipe and run everything via gravity, which will never fail, whereas a pump could fail. It doesn't consume any energy, whereas a pump does, whatever the source of the energy. So. Um, that's just something I've found over time, too. And I, what I'm just getting at there. Taking things out, yeah. yeah. Is a, I just encourage people to think critically like that, to always be assessing their system. You know, how can I do further? How can I do better? And if you want to develop your own principles, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that in my book. <laughs> <laughs> One of his books. <laughs> yeah. I no. think the permaculture principles are great. Use them. But I'm just saying, yeah. don't get yeah. locked into that's the only way not being able to shift. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that. Uh, we can use it to like, so we can look at it exactly that way. Take a permaculture principle and tweak it, or come up with our own principles. Like you know, leaves on the ground because you, you they're supposed to be left there. You leave them there. Mm -hmm. So with that kind of thinking, um, and looking at it that way, you know, if we had a crystal ball here, Brad. Um, a lot of things are happening in this movement, uh, you know, both people repair uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, and earth repair. Where do you see this movement uh, kind of going? Um, you know, if you, if, you know, and, and you know, none of this is going to be, you know, well, this is what Brad Lancaster said. Just, you know, as a, you know, you know, like I said, you know, we're getting to know some of the leaders in the movement. Where, where do they see this kind of shifting um, happening and shifting taking place? of what is possible? Well, um, 
I don't know where it's going to go, but where I find great hope is um, the more people tune in to the natural processes, what's going on in the natural world, the more they can recognize and work with those, that's where I see the hope builds. Okay? So um, we can then be in a cooperative mode with the larger world that supports us, as opposed to fighting it. And so I think permaculture is one of many tools that can help us start to see that better. Okay, so if more people tap into that and they can see, oh, I can heat and cool um, myself, my living space, just with the sun, okay, and not, no solar panels, okay, just with my, how I orient myself to the sun, okay, that's huge, okay, how do I get my water? Well, I could get my water just from the sky. Okay, or just from the runoff from these hard surfaces, as opposed to this massive infrastructure moving the water hundreds of miles. How do I dispose of my waste? Well, actually, in a natural system, there are no wastes. So all I need to do is shift my thinking of, well, how could this waste be a resource? How could my fecal matter be decomposed and transformed through natural processes, natural life forms already in the air and the soil? to do the work for me so that my fecal matter after a composting process becomes very safe, highly fertile soil. Who oh, sweet. sweet. There's no longer a waste system. All we got is a resource cycle. Sounds like, um, you know, we really talk about poop, man. Poops, well, I don't like poop, but I love what poop can become. <laughs> okay. And Brock Dahlman, a, a great friend um, uh, out there doing amazing work, he has this great saying, which I think is key, is we got to stop crapping in the water cycle. Big time. And we got to start crapping in the carbon cycle. Nice. Because the soil and the soil life, it's already adapted because just think of all the animals, the insects, the birds that are crapping in that soil all the time. It's it's already adapted and you've been used to it. Um, but we, we don't just crap on the ground, okay? We gotta do things in a way where we can tweak it. It's so gotta be it's holistically safe. managed. Yeah, it's hygienic and all that. And uh, we can speed up the transformation process. So um, there's great opportunity when we can read a natural pattern, we can figure out a process that works with it, that then drives. Nice. Our selection of what strategy is appropriate for unique conditions of this site. Love it. Love it. Brad, you're awesome, man. I appreciate your time. Um, you rock. I'm going to, obviously, this is the second edition of Volume 1 that just, you know, fairly recently came out. So uh, what are some of the, some of the, revisions and additions that were added to, to this particular one. Yep, so there's over a hundred uh, new pages, 120 new images, uh, added a whole section on how to uh, harvest the wind with passive free strategies, how to harvest um, sediment as well as water, um, and uh, really enhance the, the, the sun and shade harvesting aspects um, of pattern reading uh, and strategies as well and have updates on a number of the case studies I featured, including uh, the Afghan water farmer, Mr. Zephania Perry, Perry Maseko. And that, uh, how many years ago was that? So I first visited him 19 years ago, and then I had the chance to uh, uh, go back and see him again this past year. And that's uh, 19 years of, um, of documented cases of rainwater harvesting. So you have volume one, volume two, and... Um, Working on slowly on volume, on volume three, three. And, uh, but also working on a Spanish edition of this. There's already an Arabic version, and um, working on getting uh, um, an enhanced uh, ebook version too. And the, the website? HarvestingRainwater.com. Brad, you're awesome, man. I give everybody hugs on camera. You just All right. It. It'd be weird. It's cool. <laughs> and, and, you know, and just so we, uh, just so we, we have it, uh, you know, can we play a little bit of air guitar?
Would that be cool? Okay. okay. Let's do it right Yeah, I know. I get it. Chum, 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 chum. That's a little banjo action. <laughs> He's got a banjo. Yeah. I'll do a claw hammer. little claw hammer banjo. How's that? You're awesome, man. Guys, you rock. Uh, we love you. Stay tuned. We're going to keep bringing you really good content. Um, check out Brad's, all his books, and his website. Um, he's he's really awesome guy. So that's it. We love you. Stay tuned. We'll see you next time.